Greetings, simmers, history lovers, and curious tourists. I am the lady, I love history, and I play the Sims. There are a lot of kings, quite a few coups, and perhaps a beheading or two. One quick disclaimer, I am not a historian, just a layman who loves the game. So feel free to fact check me in the comments below, but do it nicely. We are here to have fun and learn, not to start wars. Historical creative sim videos are uploaded on the 1st of the month and speed builds on the 15th. If you want to learn more about how the channel works or have ideas for future videos, stay tuned till the end to learn more. Now, without further ado, let's make Sims history. So let's talk about William. We're working from this little snippet of the Bayou Tapestry, which shows us a guy that I think has blonde hair. It could possibly be a hat, but we're gonna go with the fact that it's blonde hair. Next we have a coin with a profile view of it, which is a really nice shot of the nose. I am a person who likes an impressive nose, so we used that. And there's also some very expensive Victorian fan art. It is in no way accurate, it is in no way viable, but that is a very striking gaze, so we used it. The only other thing that um, we really know f about William is that he was 5 foot 9-ish, which was considered pretty tall for his time. He also got really fat in his old age, and he was supposedly pretty stocky, so I tried to give him a bit of a pooch on the stomach, because, you know, why not? It doesn't have to be perfect. We all have our flaws, and they make us beautiful. So, William's backstory a little bit. He was the son of Robert the Magnificent, who was the Duke of Normandy, and a common woman named Herleva. He was born out of wedlock, so he was known throughout his life as William the Bastard. He became Duke by the age of, like, 12, but he was still known as William the Bastard, both to his face and behind his back, so he was not a fan of that. And I kind of have a personal view that I like to think the reason why he decided to go and invade England and become king was not so much out of asserting his rights as he just wanted a better nickname than the Bastard. I just like to think that he was that petty. What are you doing in England? Mind your own business! Pettiness aside, the King of England is Edward the Confessor. He dies in about 1066, and three men decide that they are going to be the next King of England. And that was obviously William, and there was Harold Godwinson, who was technically English, and then there was Harold Hardrada, who was Norwegian. Harold Godwinson was already in England, so he kind of beat everybody to the punch, and he was crowned. Harold Hardrada then invades England to take the throne from the first Harold, and he gets beaten at Stamford Bridge. But the thing that happens in wars and fighting is your soldiers tend to die, and like two seconds later, who shows up but William, ready to fight with all of his soldiers alive, and he completely destroys Harold Godwinson at Hastings, and then he decides that he is now King of England. Unfortunately, there's now a conflict of interest because he is the King of England, but he's also a French Duke. And France, particularly the French King, not so sure on how they feel about that. So, you know, Normandy is still technically subservient to the King of the Franks, on paper at least, but is England. King of France was probably in a way like, I'm now technically King of England, you just expanded our empire. And William was like, no, I expanded my empire. Normandy? Yeah, sure, fair. It's in France. You are technically my boss as far as any and all events happening in Normandy. But England is my space, my thing, get out of my room, mom. This is my area. This is honestly just foreshadowing. It never works. France does not ever agree totally. England does not ever agree totally on whose stuff belongs to who, where the line is, where are the boundaries, which king is top king. Oh, and it just, it becomes a very long, bloody tradition and foreshadowing. Tradition! William is officially king, but his main focus right now is England. And the reason why is because rebellions, baby, they be everywhere. Particularly in York and in Ely. I believe it's pronounced Ely, E-L-Y. I speak American English, so who knows? Then again, English, who knows how you pronounce anything. Another problem that I get to blame William for, because French is what the Normans spoke. Shocker, I know. And so when he rolls into England, guess what becomes the official language of England? French, not English, French. French! Why do you think I have this outrageous accent, you silly king? 
And then, you know, after a few centuries of blending together, we get the nightmare of a language that we have today, which is why we don't pronounce it Bologna, we say baloney, even though it is spelled Bologna. And it's also why baloney rhymes with pony, even though they are in no way spelled the same, and I hate English so much, even though it's my first language. Oh, I blame you, William. Why couldn't you just learn the local language? What was what was so hard? I could have been sounding like a Viking right now and speaking old English instead of this monstrosity gargle sound that is modern English. Oh gosh, I hate it so much. Okay, back back on track. Lots of rebellions, William's king, he has to keep putting them down. As they keep happening, because who knew common, you know, the common people would be a problem? <laughs> Shocking. Who would have thought the people that you're suppressing would, oh, I don't know, get mad. He decides to be a bit more heavy-handed. So first thing he does is castles. The reason why England's got such pretty castles, my actually mostly Wales, is the Normans. William the Conqueror was like, best way to keep control of the populace is to have a giant stone structure that they can't get in or out of unless I say it's okay. Next, no more Anglo-Saxons, no more Scandinavians, no more Britons. Maybe the Jutes were actually still around. I'm not entirely sure what happened to the Jutes. Well, if there were Jutes. None of those people who were in the nobility, they're out. Across the board, the people in charge now are the Normans. They get to be the vassals. They get the high ups. All the other people are either dead or seriously demoted. Once again, that really solidifies that whole we speak French now business. And then finally, something that we all know him very well for is the Doomsday Book. Giant census of everything, everyone, all the money, all the people, all the land. Not only can he now see all of the possible rebellions happening from his tall, tall castle, he has a list of names to know who exactly he needs to off. But he did accomplish at least one goal I think he secretly had, which was to get a better nickname, because history now knows him as William the Conqueror, not William the Bastard. Slaughterer might be more accurate, but Conqueror does have a much nicer ring to it. Long live the king. I'm your king! Well, I didn't vote for you! Okay, one thing it is very hard to do is be a king without a queen. And in the case of William, you need that legitimacy that she will bring to your reign. And the queen for him was Matilda of Flanders. Again, not really any likenesses from her time period, or at least when she was alive. So instead, I went with more Victorian fan art. There is this statue in, in Luxembourg of her, and there's some Victorian engravings and things like that that I also chose a picture from. There are some descriptions of what her sons kind of looked like. Tended to be kind of stocky men, brawny, and they had dark hair, according to the historians. So, since the Bayou Tapestry, at least my interpretation of it, showed William to be a blonde, I decided that Matilda gets to be the lucky winner of having the dark locks. Who is Matilda? She is, oh, the top, like, cream of the crop. Like, you can't really get higher than her. She is the daughter of Baldwin V, the Count of Flanders. Okay, Flanders, very rich, very powerful, very strategically important county. It's now in, like, what would be modern-day parts of France and, like, the Netherlands. That was Flanders. Through her mother, Adela, she is also the granddaughter of the King of the Franks, Robert II. Through her father, she is also a descendant of Charlemagne, and I know today it's very common for there's like a thing where it's like, oh, we can all trace our descent to Charlemagne. Not so much back then. The gene pool hadn't dispersed quite as much, so her being related to Charlemagne, big deal. Ooh, it's like being a Kennedy. She's a blood relation to at least five dukes and five counts, probably more than that, but I just did a quick skim, and the Bishop of Metz, which I don't know why that would necessarily be important, but I just wanted to throw him in there. I just, I love that word, Metz. I'm probably saying it wrong. Once again, thank you, William, for the English language. She is educated and pretty, and essentially is just everything William is not. She's educated, she's a professional, she's a grown-up. He proposed, she turns him down because she is Matilda of Flanders. He does not take rejection well. Seems to be pretty agreed on that there was a confrontation of sorts outside of a church. She was going to church, he rides into Flanders and confronts her on her way to church. We don't know what words, but words were definitely said. One version says that after the words, William reached up, she's on a horse, grabs her braid, pulls her off her horse, and she hits the ground. She's 
four foot three and horses are tall and he just he just drops her basically a whole story by the hair the hair historical historians i don't know how long you understand it takes some of us to grow hair but it takes a long time and he's just ripping it out like it's nothing pulls her down and she hits the ground now the first version says that after that he walks away the second version says that after the dehorsing he beats her physically with his fist man is five nine she's four foot three he's basically like what punching a toddler and this is what makes her decide to marry him i have some thoughts first matilda was about 20 when they got married she is a woman okay second off she is a confident queen it doesn't say that someone rejected him on her behalf no she did she is matilda of flanders she doesn't need him he needs her and she does not want him and you're telling me that this woman falls in love because somebody punched her in the nose no they haven't even met no 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 no, no. this this is not no i mm -mm. this is ridiculous completely made up fan fiction awful beyond just her awesomeness in general like just oh, god save the queen i love matilda their marriage is supposedly a bit very happy there is no record of william having illegitimate children he like cries when she dies and gives up hunting which was apparently his favorite thing to do why even your pastimes involve like murder of innocence i just i can't whatever why would she have then wanted to marry him maybe it was just a battle of wits maybe when the words were said and he rode off she was like i like that man Ugh, it was a beautiful dance of sarcasm and wit and that's what attracted her to him instead of you know his fist to her face somewhere in history there was probably a male chronicler hiding in a monastery who didn't want to take the time to figure out what actually happened and you slowly dying sad lonely little man how dare you just dig for the actual story and figure it out be a reporter put in the work lazy Ugh. so no i refuse to believe that that is how their marriage began we doth not purchase it, Slick Willie. Mm -hmm. We doth not purchase it. Be calm. But regardless of how it began, they're married. Problem with that, though, they breached the rules of consanguinity. Basically, it means don't marry your cousins. And at that time, within seven generations related to you, like seven cousins and out, you're good. Seven cousins down, stay away. People obviously broke this rule all the time, but you weren't supposed to without getting permission from the church, and they didn't get permission. So they finally got their marriage recognized by agreeing to build two churches as penance and giving their daughter Cecilia to the church. Basically, would become abbess one day. The marriage was good. She is a mother of way, way too many children for someone who's four foot three, and she makes sure that they're all really well, really well educated. Even the girls, which, you know, not common, they could all read and write, and they could also read Latin. But as families tend to do, feuds will be happening. William and their oldest son, Robert, did not like each other. Robert especially rubbed him the wrong way. He wanted to disinherit him. We'll get into that later. And Robert decides to try to rebel, and so he goes to his uncles on his mother's side, the King of France, and he's like, hey, I want to be Duke of Normandy without dad's oversight. Just, I really just want any reason to, you know, mess with his day. Does not, does not end in his favor. So Matilda tries to smooth it over, but she also kind of sent Robert a whole bunch of money while he was in exile. William was not happy when he found out, and yet somehow she still managed to have them come together for a truce on Easter. It was so nice. It doesn't last, but poor woman tried. She just wanted a nice family dinner. Just be nice to each other. Be nice. As queen, she really spends more of her time in Normandy acting as regent, but she does come to England after William is crowned king, and she ha she sets up a coronation for herself to be crowned queen. William is re-crowned king, but there's three new phrases incorporated to the ceremony. Emphasize how important she is as queen. Queens are divinely placed by God. They share in royal power. They have like their own distinct role, and people will be you know blessed by her virtue and whatnot. And that is how queens of England start having way more importance as far as the coronation goes. Before then, some were crowned, some were, but nobody really cared because it was like, oh, she's the wife. Like, you know, she can have a nice ceremony, but if you get married in a courthouse or if you get married in a cathedral, you're still married. Not so after this. She she managed to set up a precedent of it being very important that queens of England are crowned. And later down the line, with Henry VIII and his plethora of wives, that's going to become a sticking point. Good job, Matilda. Setting up the, the dominoes there. More controversy. I can't wait. But one thing is for sure, oh, I'm such a fan. Matilda is the undisputed queen.
So Robert becomes the Duke of Normandy. Kurt Host, by the way, is a nickname that his father apparently gave him, which means shorty. So William didn't like Robert to the point of wanting to disinherit him entirely. He didn't want to give him nothing. He is convinced not to do this, probably for the best. So instead of making Robert the King of England, which is arguably, you know, the better sounding title, he becomes the Duke of Normandy. William's second surviving son is going to become the King of England, which is William Rufus. And his third surviving son, Henry, is going to be given money when his father dies to buy land. But back to Robert. He really wants to be king. That just seems to be a running thing here. He tries to rebel against his father a couple times while William is alive. He loses every single time. Then his brother, William Rufus, becomes king. And he decides that, no, 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 I was supposed to be king. So he tries to fight him. And again, he loses. A deal is kind of made that if I die, if William Rufus, if he dies, then you can be King Robert. And if you die, then William Rufus will get to be Duke of Normandy again and, you know, recombine these two territories. The French king probably didn't like that idea. But that's, that's the plan they're going with. When William Rufus does die, that's not how the plan proceeded. Because the youngest brother, Henry, the one who got nothing when his father died, decides he wants to be king. Robert thinks that's not fair cricket, and so he decides to go fight for his right, and he fails. What? And once again, he's, yeah, he's got nothing. And it's also bad because he was on his way back from, like, the Crusades, too. So Henry stabbed him in the back while he was coming back from trying to fight a holy war, which, I mean, it wasn't actually that holy. It was pretty just based on money, but that's a different topic. He called the Crusades a foolish quest. It's like Robert can't get a break. He, he just, he has to get used to disappointment, and he never does. He keeps trying, and each time it's like he, he, he loses even worse than the last time. Like, at a certain point, it's like, for your own dignity, dude. Just stop. Just please stop. Give up. That's Robert. You know, at least he's at least he's optimistic. You know, he never gave up. I, I appreciate that. He had goals. He never achieved them. But he also never stopped trying. And maybe there's a moral in lesson in that story. I'm not sure. But it is what happened. Get used to disappointment. After Robert, there is a second brother named Richard, who died young. And I sadly couldn't make him. Suck. They also had three daughters named Agatha, Adeliza, and Matilda, and Sims only lets you have eight Sims in household, so they had to be cut, and they also had the least information about them that I could find, so sorry guys. You suck. You suck. Sisters? <laughs> Cecilia, also known as Cecily sometimes. So she becomes an abbess. She is really well educated, just like the rest of her siblings, but as an abbess, she gets to run the abbey of the Holy Trinity. She gets a lot of money from her relatives, you know, to support it, because why not? She's related to, like, every crown head in Europe, and she gets to study, and she gets to promote arts, and she gets to help the people of her area, and she apparently did a very good job of running it. And she has such an uncomplicated life compared to the rest of them. Like, it's so calm, so peaceful. I feel like if there is a favorite child, I don't think William really liked any of his children, but if he did, I think it would be her. I'm probably judging this way too harshly. I'm still going to, though. At first, when I learned about her, I pitied her for being the one, you know, shipped off to boarding school and never let come home. But now, I see you, Cecilia, and I kind of want to be you. Like, if, if I had to time travel, yours is the spot I want. Yay, Cecilia. Good for you. She's not doing too bad. I feel like in a different life she might have been like a professor or an academic, but... Abbas is probably the closest equivalent we can get. Can I just read? We need to talk real quick about murder in this family. It is a very prevalent thing. That older brother Richard, who couldn't fit in our family, R.I.P., he died in a forest on a hunting trip, supposedly by accident, okay? And this happened before his father died, so he didn't have a throne for anybody to try to take away. William Rufus here, who becomes King of England, you know, thanks to William the Conqueror's stupid division system, 
also dies in a forest on a hunting trip, supposedly by accident. No one knows who shot the arrow that done him in. His younger brother Henry, the one who got no land, is in that forest. Highly suspicious, but there's not forensic science in this time period, so who's to say who actually did it? I know who I think did it. I just feel like if you're a king, don't invite your brothers to family events, especially ones that involve heavy weaponry or violence in any way, shape, or form, unless you're playing Uno. Well, actually, that can be pretty violent. Unless you're just, you know, sitting in chairs, staring in silence. Just don't hang out with your family. You are a king. Understand that you do not have brothers. You have rivals. It was just a tragic accident in the woods with no witnesses. Murder? What murder? So, William Rufus. He's called Rufus apparently because he had very ruddy cheeks. I used to think it was because he was a redhead, but according to that one historian, he had dark hair. I don't know who's right. He has dark hair, and I tried to give him some less death complexion cheeks. He had a lot to deal with this king. Like I said, Robert was always there, a rebellion. The English are still not happy over the fact that they can't speak French, and that's who's in charge. Doesn't seem to have been a bad ruler administrator in any way, shape, or form. The only thing that caused any real controversy outside of the family squabbles is the fact that he was most likely bisexual, so when he dies, he didn't have any kids. It just becomes a free-for-all, which means just more rebellions. Why is everyone rebelling? Like, why can't you just, oh, for heaven's sakes, just be happy with the chair you got and just sit in it? He died in the year 1100. Way to start a new century by killing the king. Oh, I'm sorry, by the king dying by accident. That's how he died. That's plausible. Next in the lineup of dysfunctional family members we have to go into is Constance. She marries the Duke of Brittany and known to have been very proper, a good administrator, and cold? But then others just say that she was shy, so I feel like it depended on who you ask whether or not Constance was a nice person. But she did her job really well. However, she also dies, and it is also speculated that her husband killed her because he didn't seem too sad about it when she died and they had no kids, so they were like, maybe he offed her so he could get an heir. And ah, uh, just another murder in this family. At least this time it wasn't via a blood relation. So, you know, progress. It was just you married into the murder. But can we just stop with the killing, please? Can we talk about our problems? Maybe go to therapy? There's gotta be a nun or a monk somewhere with a listening ear and nothing else to do during their day. Everybody else I feel like was pretty busy, you know, with the wars and the famines and the working. But just can we please stop with the murdering? Also, Constance just seems like she wanted to just do her job and be left alone. Kill Robert if you're gonna kill someone. Don't kill Richard and William and Constance, the ones who don't seem to be doing anything. Just what? Why are the fates so unkind? But here we are. Murder. Murder, 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 murder. Hello, sir. Murder. Then we have Adela, Countess of Blois. It is spelled B L O I S. So in English, I want to call her Countess of Blois. But no. I asked someone who speaks French. It is apparently Blois. I hate English so much. Also spelling. What is with this spelling? I just... Mm, it's fine. Anyways, Adela, Countess of Blois. She has a happy marriage. Yay! Finally! No murdering! She gets married to the Count of Blois. They have several children. They seem to respect each other and like each other. And she is a good countess and a ruler and administrator alongside her husband. Doesn't seem to get involved in her brother's rebellions. I did give her the pasty complexion. Sorry about that. I'm just seeing that right now. But yay! She pulls it off. Anyways, she seems to have a good life. One flaw with Adela. She has a son, or a spawn, if you will, called Stephen. Stephen 
is going to later decide he wants to be King of England. Why? I do not know, but apparently it seems to be the best throne going. He is going to get in a fight with his cousin Matilda over it, because even though Matilda is a descendant of William the Conqueror through the male line and her father was king, he is a man. And even though he's descended through the female line, that should put him on top. For some reason, this becomes discussion point of the decade, all because of which parent and gender lining up would be the better idea. You're pathological. It's too late for flattery. Why can't they just, you know, fill out a resume and then just be judged by that? But no. War. Of course it's war. It's always war. And I love it. Oh, I just, the drama. So, Adela is the mother of Stephen. So even though I really want to like you, Adela, I have to blame you for that. Just the anarchy that will follow. Thank you. Why couldn't you just raise your kids to be happy with what they have? And not just go take other people's stuff. But no, I, I feel like Adela was probably one of those parents who like put the kids' personal happiness over like teaching them life skills, personality. It's fine. It all works out fine. I mean, not for the people who get slaughtered, but for the rest of us who have hindsight, we're good. Yeah. We want them to be happy. After Adela, we have the youngest kid, Henry Blo Beauclerc? Beauclerc. Beauclerc. Henry. We have Henry. I'm not sure what his nickname means, but I put it in there because he's not technically king yet, and I gave his brothers their nicknames because I thought they were funny, so he gets his. Henry. He is the youngest child, but ugh, like Joseph in the Bible, he is going to wind up getting all the things. When his father dies, William the Conqueror, he is not given an inheritance beyond some money to go buy one for himself. And in some hilarious twist of fate, he winds up being King of England and Duke of Normandy in his own right. Look at you go. Good job, Harry. You did it. Somehow, you were born last, and you ended up first because you are the only one who survived. Oh man, this is so messed up. But it's so interesting, like, it's just so funny. Like, oh, I love how much drama and politics, it's just so straightforward. It's literally just family politics that affects the actual politics. Not that that's a good thing or like the way to run the world, but it's just so much straight more straightforward. Like, the most trying to justify themselves people seem to do is just blatant race- Oh, not racism, that's later. That's definitely later, but not yet. Just blatant sexism. And being like, oh, I'm a man, so I should have it. Like, that's the most justification they seem to go with here. Or, I killed him, so now I have it. Which is, again, not a good reason, but straightforward. You know, there's no trying to, like, convince anybody that they are justified beyond the fact of I saw it, I want it, I took it. Or, she has weaker arms, I saw it, I want it, I took it. And I just, I appreciate that simplicity. And I also appreciate the fact that I feel like if you were in a country and you could just like see how dysfunctional that family was, you'd be like, hmm, 10 kids? They're probably gonna be in power for at least a century. Anybody feel like we should move to Italy? It's sunny there. I just, I appreciate the straightforwardness of that. It's much simpler just to know when to get out of Dodge. Not a good political system, but straightforward. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses. Hey, what's with the strange breeze? They is my family. Thank you, villagers and nobles alike, for watching my video. If you have any person, dynasty, or group from history you want me to make, share in the comments of the comments below. Next time, we will be building William the Conqueror's birthplace, the Chateau de Falaise. For each historical figure, I will also make a speed build of a place either directly connected or associated with them in some way. So make sure to include what build you want to see along with your sim suggestions. Then, the Royal Parliament over on Patreon will vote on your ideas for future videos. Whichever Sims History Create a Sim video you choose will be uploaded on the first of every month, and the corresponding speed builds will be on the 15th. Any other sim videos I make will be posted at random, so make sure to click the bell to get in on the chaos. If you would like to officially join our royal court and support the channel, feel free to click the link in the description and pop over to ye old Patreon. But if not, you are still a welcome villager here. Please like and subscribe, and as a reward for making it all the way through the video, here, enjoy this after credit scene. Farewell, friends. 45.
32 bedrooms, 19 bathrooms, but not one single drop of coffee. Dad hated caffeine. Well, he hated children, too, and he had plenty of us. <laughs> My children never caused such trouble. They all became acupuncturists. Well, we can all be acupuncturists. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Oh, don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. To me, I'm I get the fist cause of y'all. Y'all not gonna get a fist. Well, I guess it turns out at the end of the day, sometimes you just gotta hit kids. Don't make jokes! You're bad at it! Girl, don't do it. It's not worth it. I'm not gonna do it, girl. I was just thinking about it. I'm not gonna do it. I did it.